Hello and welcome to uh, the first part and the introduction to module 8. In this module we are going to speak about the fascinating relationship between emotion and language learning and language teaching because of course as we know we believe that their uh, emotion is very important when it comes to learning a language the first language a second or a foreign language any language so in the language classroom um, emotion has not been given sufficient attention um, and especially in the second language learning literature However, it might just be, as we know, the fundamental basis of motivation for learning a language in the first place. Normally, if you want to learn a language, it's because you have some kind of positive attitude, positive motivation, or you feel some kind of positive emotion towards it. If you don't like it, it's more difficult, we believe, to learn a language. When someone obliges you to learn anything, not only a language, then you don't feel predisposed and do you uh, have less uh, chances of being successful. Uh, but the only emotional variable that has been extensively researched so far uh, in language learning is motivation. Mm -hmm. We have studies such as those of Diane Sternberg or Gardner and Lambert, etc. Emotion, we believe, is at the basis of any learning or also at the basis of the absence of learning as I said because if we don't like or we don't feel positive emotions for a language um, we may not learn it properly and this is something that Schumann also, Schumann also considered in his article of 1997. Uh, McIntyre and uh, Gregerson also argue that Positive emotion facilitates the building of resources because positive emotion tends to broaden a person's perspective, opening the individual to absorb the language. Of course, we're not meaning with this uh, that uh, always when learning a language you have to feel positive and you have to feel positive emotions. Because sometimes negative emotions are useful as well. Mm? You sometimes may be angry in class, you may be and if you express this, maybe, you, mm, well, you can also learn from that anger and you can also learn about negative emotions in the language. But what we mean is that, in general, a good predisposition will facilitate learning. And, uh, you know, some investigation, some research has been done in language textbooks. And what has been found is that in foreign language textbooks, and especially in English, foreign language textbooks, uh, we don't find any uh, emotive language or we don't teach or include in the, in the units uh, interesting facts about the expression of emotion in that language or how to socialize expressing emotions. So it is very hard then to socialize or to function in any language using emotionless textbooks phrases, you know, if you just use those cold phrases that sometimes are found in, f in textbooks which then are not useful at all when you go to the foreign country and want to speak the language then you realize that you do not have the pragmatic competence which has a lot to do with the emotional competence and the, uh, you know, emotive expressive language uh, that you don't have and you cannot use mm? and therefore you cannot function well in that language. Because of course we acknowledge that language is abstract, it is logical, conceptual, rational, informational and neutral and it's also geared to factual information. But uh, besides that, language is not a cold instrument, it is strongly covered, uh, colored by emotion and therefore that also has to be taken into consideration in language textbooks and in the language class. Mm, the ontogeny uh, studies tell us that the early interaction between caregiver and child is nonverbal, expressive and full of emotion. In fact, that's the first kind of interaction you have with a baby. You don't speak the language, but you have this mm, expressive and emotive kind of interaction. And research on language acquisition has shown that language has its own line of development starting in the womb. So language starts in the womb, 
not just when you come into this world and when you are outside the womb, inside. And it develops in the context of emotion in interaction or exchange. Mm? When this context fails, language development is impaired. And we know that. If the mm, child doesn't have a, a, you know, an emotionally uh, positive uh, environment, then it is more difficult to learn to communicate. And phylogenetic studies uh, tell us that the signals used by hominids for communication were strongly emotive mm -hmm. and at the same time strongly context-bound. So there was a lot of iconicity and diaxis, you know, in this first primeval way of communication as well as a lot of emotion. Early humans distinguished themselves from the other hominids through strong inner group interaction and that has to do with cooperation. Cooperation then was important and then the you know, uh, links, uh, emotive links between the participants for cooperation were important as well. And so an important part of this self-domestication had to do with the control of emotions. Now, this is very important for the teaching and learning of languages because we know that emotion is at the basis of language, at the origins of language, and it, it is also at the basis of any kind of learning. But the communication of emotion in a foreign language can be very difficult, as we all know. Mm? It is difficult to express emotions in your own language, so of course it's going to be even more difficult in a language you still do not um, have a command of. Um, so at the initial stages, we lack you know, the linguistic and the pragmatic means to express the full range of, of our emotions in a way that would satisfy our communicative needs and which would be considered appropriate by our interlocutors who have that language as their first language. So this is, it is interesting to read what uh, Dival, uh, in, his, uh, in his book about multilingual emotions and emotions in multiple languages, uh, he talks about his own experience when he came to Spain and he was studying in Salamanca. Uh, and he tells us that although he made some progress with his Spanish, he, he was unable to share his sense of frustration or his exhilaration with his host family uh, as they were monolingual Spanish speakers. So he says, I could not tell jokes and I was unable to say anything that sounded remotely interesting to my ears. And this was because he did not have the pragmatic competence to express emotions. And look at this, he speaks about jokes. We have one of the modules here uh, in this MOOC, as you have seen, in module five, we talk about humor and emotion, the connection between humorous uh, verbal interaction and emotions. So we always say that if you're able to understand and express the humor of a foreign language and culture, you have a command of that language. Therefore, uh, in order to be a good bilingual speaker, then you need to have a command of the emotions in that language. And, and that is why we are so uh, interested in this topic here. Uh, so, as, as I see it, there are two main areas in which the study of emotion should be considered in language learning and in language teaching. One of them, I'm sorry about the numbers here, it should be one and two, I don't know why it appears one and one, but anyway, it was just something that happened after I, I uh, prepared the presentation. Uh, the first one is e emotional competence in the foreign language, which, so you ha we have to tend to develop this emotional competence in the foreign language, which will lead us to have this, what we call emotional bilingualism. Mm -hmm. And this has to do with the learning of the particular linguistic strategies and competencies for us to be able to express our emotions or other people's emotions as well, how other people feel, or and at the different levels of linguistic description. And this is what we saw in the first five modules of this uh, MOOC, mm, how you can express emotion at the phonological level by means of intonation, for instance, or at the lexical level by using certain words, or even at the syntactic level by using certain constructions, etc. And then the other area in which it is interesting to do research about related to emotion and language learning 
is the one that has to do with the affective facts linked to the teaching and learning of a, of a foreign language. So that this has to do with the motivation and the management of emotions in the classroom, hmm? the emotional attitude uh, which will trigger one or a, I mean a positive or a negative uh, reaction towards the language learned. So that is why the teacher of, lang of the language in question here is an important factor, as we are going to see. So as regards the first aspect, emotional competence in the uh, foreign language, which leads to the so-called emotional bilingualism. Uh, as I said, learning how emotions are conceptualized and expressed at the different linguistic levels, mm, and including, as I said, it could be, well, phonological level, etc., also interjections, swearing, humor, irony, metaphors, code switching may also be uh, um, a contextualization cue for showing emotions. Mm. And uh, nowadays, special attention is given to the question on how emotions determine and structured texts both at the micro and the macro structures. Not only the micro structure by looking at items of vocabulary, but the whole macro structure of a, of a text. And we are now here just give some examples at the lexical level and why it is important to take these aspects, emotion aspects into uh, account for the teaching of, of a language, or also for when you're learning it. Uh, so we should bear in mind that some categorizations of emotion are not universal. For instance, the word frustration in English has no equivalent in Arabic, according to Russell, because I don't speak Arabic, but these are data that I have taken from Russell. The word disgust has no exact e equivalent in Polish. Also, we have concepts such as uh, Japanese amai, mm, which is the feeling you get from surrendering to another imperfect safety, which we don't have in English, for instance, I think, or in Spanish. We can express it by using periphrases or whatever, but we don't have the, the, the term mm, to express that particular kind of emotion. Also, the German schadenfreude, which means or refers to the pleasure derived from another's displeasure, which has no equivalent in other languages or the Australian Aboriginal language Jidjungali, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it well, has, makes no lexical distinction between fear and shame. And we do make a distinction between fear and shame in English or in Spanish too as well. Mm, in some, also in some other in African languages, for instance, Luganda, the same word covers what in English we would distinguish as anger and sadness. Mm, so they have the same word for, for two things that for us are different emotions, anger and sadness. And uh, even the, the concept of emotion cannot be said to be universal. I mean, the lexicalization mm, of the concept of emotion. It's not that uh, because I believe that all human beings feel emotions, but not all the languages lexicalize the concept. Mm. So the, the bimim couscous mean of Papua New Guinea or the Gitjingali of Australia, the Ifalukians of Micronesia and the Samoans, for instance, do not have a word for emotion. The concept here may be implicit. It's not that they don't know about emotions, but they do not have a word for it. And so these are important facts to be considered when teaching the vocabulary of emotions in the language classroom. First of all, that the borders between categories of emotion are fuzzy and vague rather than clear-cut. Mm? Sometimes we speak of a continuum between emotions and uh, they cannot be clearly distinguished, and especially so in two languages. Mm? And maybe the range covered by shame, and we know the, rain, the range covered by shame in English, for instance, is different from the range covered by vergüenza in Spanish. As, uh, we're going to see, and some um, authors have, have shown as well. Uh, and also that membership within a category is a matter of degree rather than all or none. So different categories tend to overlap one another rather than to be mutually exclusive. Some categories overlap each other almost completely and others 
to a high degree, others to a minimal degree, and some not at all. As I said, if you look at the example of vergüenza versus shame, we have embarrassment in English, and so in Spanish, vergüenza would be, will cover both shame and embarrassment, uh, and we have, we see in English, so we have two terms for just one in Spanish. So, uh, again, uh, this should be known by teachers when, when teaching the vocabulary of emotions, but it's just one aspect of emotions because, as I said, uh, we should teach them at and how at all the levels, and we should teach our students how they the all uh, emotion permeates all the levels of linguistic description. Now, regarding the second aspect that I said that it's interesting to research about concerning emotions and language learning or teaching, uh, which is the affective facts linked to the teaching or, or learning of a foreign language. So I, here I wanted you to uh, listen to Professor Kaufman here uh, speaking about what for him is a wonderful language teacher is, sorry, what, what he considers to be a wonderful language teacher. So I'm going to go to the um, YouTube uh, link so you can watch it here. Hi there, Steve Kaufman. Today I want to continue talking a bit about teachers because I made a blog post uh, about why uh, a teacher can be so influential in our language learning. Even though I feel that to a large extent language learning is dependent on the attitude of the learner, but many people aren't motivated enough, many people haven't yet been turned on, Many people have inhibitions. Many people, probably the vast majority of learners, benefit from having the right kind of teacher. A teacher who encourages them, who stimulates them, who provides that human face-to-face oh. -face contact that makes them want to learn. Very often we want to learn for the teacher. All of these many, many reasons. If the teacher uh, is the right kind of person, a good communicator, warm, with empathy, enthusiastic, they can be absolutely decisive, a decisive element in the success of the student. And in that regard, I want to pay tribute to such a teacher whom I met when I was in Saigon, or excuse me, in, in Hanoi. His name is Mal Pritchard, or Pritchard. He's an Australian, a retired Australian, who lives in Hanoi. And when we had our meetup in Hanoi, he came with a number of other people. He would let me pay for my beer and whatever little munchies we had. A very generous, warm, gregarious type of person. And he, in his retirement years, claiming that he can live more cheaply in Vietnam than in Australia on his pension and whatever retirement income he has, he is a volunteer teacher, sort of like the Pied Piper of Hamlin who gathers Vietnamese students around him uh, in the center of old Hanoi and teaches them English. And uh, it's, it's a phenomenal story in my mind of people communicating across cultural divides. Uh, as I remember, he speaks some Vietnamese. I can't say how well he speaks Vietnamese, but he's totally comfortable living in Vietnam, happy being there. Obviously gets a great sense of satisfaction from the genuine good that he is able to do and I think very often we get more satisfaction in giving than in receiving and his students are very very happy that Mal is there for them so I'm going to post in the description links to two videos one which describes his program both of these videos are done by Mal's students whom Mal admits are much more proficient when it comes to uh, technology and such than Mal is but I did mention in my blog post, which I might also put a link to in my description, uh, I mentioned that um, I mentioned Donald Duffy, this excellent Spanish teacher in uh, Delaware in the US. I also mentioned uh, Maurice Rabotin, who was a great inspiration to me in my French and then in my subsequent interest in language learning. And so here, is a bit of a profile of Mal Pritchard. And I am sure there are lots of these uh, excellent teachers out there and they have a major impact on language learning success. So 
thank you for listening and this is for Mal. I promised to do something like this a lot earlier and uh, with one thing and another I never did. But uh, here we go. Thank you for listening. Bye for now. Okay. So, all right. Okay. Uh, now that you've watched this video, I've used this video in, other, in another talk I've given outside this MOOC because I think it is interesting to see how Professor Kaufman here, Kaufer, sorry, describes, um, no, it's Kauf, Kaufman, sorry, uh, describes uh, what, uh, well, this teacher that he met and, and how uh, he thought that he was the ideal kind of language teacher. Now, if you Think of what he said, and if you if you uh, look at it, uh, does he speak about any particular linguistic structure that a good teacher should teach, or any particular way or accent that he should teach? Uh, no, in fact, he doesn't say anything about that. What he considers to be more important is, first of all, that in general. The language teacher is a, is a good person, which means that he's an emotionally intelligent person, uh, that he's an encouraging, stimulating teacher. He uses words such as warm, good communicator, empathetic, enthusiastic. Mm? He says generous, generous, warm, a genuinely good person, mm? a person that takes more satisfaction in giving than in receiving. So, what is he talking about here? What are the conditions then for a, for a teacher of language or for a person to be a good teacher? What he mainly focuses on is emotions and feelings and how he manages the feelings, his own feelings and also, and also those of the students and how he manages in that way to motivate the students. And so, uh, this is an aspect that I think and we believe in general that uh, should be uh, researched uh, or further researched because there aren't enough studies. There are some studies on emotional experience in the classroom such as the ones that, well, that I'm going to uh, show here. Mercer, for instance, uh, made her learners keep a journal focusing on their emotional experience in the language classroom or Pavlenko concluded that the perception of different selves is a general part of the multilingual experience. So this is an important aspect to take into consideration that you may feel different when speaking a different language. And so that's why we say it's important to be emotional, multi or bilingual, uh, an emotional multi or bilingual. Uh, also, Santa Maria, um, Carmen Santa Maria, who's a member of our group, she has published a study combining appraisal theory, as a theory of uh, evaluation, and politeness theory for the analysis of classroom interaction. Or Crego et al. have uh, shown uh, that positive rational, both rational and emotional coping strategies, for instance, problem solving, positive reappraisal, etc., are negatively associated with perceived stress. So there is no stress if you have positive coping strategies, whereas negative emotional co coping strategies mm, are linked to increased academic stress. Mm, so then negative emotions are not good for academic stress. Now, of course, uh, this is just a few uh, studies, but more research is needed on emotional aspects in the teaching of foreign languages. And uh, so to conclude, mm, uh, I'll say that when people feel emotions, they do not only make their internal states visible, but also perform linguistic actions which are interpersonal in nature and have particular consequences. And by doing so, human beings reveal and at the same time affect certain aspects of the cognitive and social systems they form part of. There is perhaps nothing more human than the verbal expression of emotion, because we know animals may express certain basic emotions in nonverbal ways, 
but they cannot talk about them. Hmm? And all this, of course, has immediate implications for the teaching learning of foreign languages. Emotion is at the basis of any learning or absence of learning, and thus a crucial trait exhibited by effective teachers is the ability to create a supportive and caring emotional environment. So, coming up in this module, I finish my introduction, but in the same module we will continue talking about learning languages and emotion. And in the next video, Drs. Marrero and Carranza, members of our group as well, will talk to us in more detail about the relationship between emotions, learning, education, and the second language or the foreign language. And basically, about how it is better to learn a language when you have a positive emotional attitude towards such language and you are in the flow, hmm? you know, in the flow when learning it, supposedly, as when you are meditating, you are in the flow. That would be the ideal way to learn a language. Then we will listen to uh, two extra talks by Professor Jean-Marc Duval from Birkbeck College, London. The first one is going to be on multilingualism and emotion, and the second one on how hard it is to recognize emotions in a native versus a foreign language. And this would be at the end of, of the module, but of course, what I'm doing uh, now is just giving you the presentation. So enjoy the rest of the module and see you in the next one. Goodbye.